we're going to start talking about one of the patterns that's very heavily used in the context of started services. We'll talk about a number of other patterns later as we cover other parts of the material related to services. And after we cover this pattern, we're then going to start talking about more detail around the bound services. Keep in mind, up to this point, we've only talked about the started services. Now we're going to go ahead and start talking about bound services as well. But before we do that, let's start talking about the pattern that we've been covering here implicitly. I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but we haven't talked about it as a pattern in any detail yet. So the particular pattern we're going to be covering is called the command processor pattern. And this pattern appears in a number of different places. The original pattern with the name command processor appeared in the book Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture, Volume 1, which was about systems of patterns. And it talked about a lot of different architectural patterns. There's another pattern that appeared in the Gang of Four book that's called the command pattern, which is related to the command processor pattern, but it's not quite identical. The actual particular implementation of this pattern I'm going to be describing came from yet another paper, which was written by a couple of other folks. And this is called uh, Command Revisited. And they attempted to take the, the best of the command pattern from the Gang of Four book, the command processor pattern from the POSA 1 book, and then they added a few new things, and that appeared. And it's kind of interesting to think about how this all occurred. Why do we need to keep rewriting these patterns? And what happens, of course, is as people get more experience trying to apply patterns to a broader range of context, to a broader range of applicability domains, they begin to realize how the initial attempts at describing the pattern were probably over-constrained by the original context in which the pattern was identified. So the folks who were doing the original Gang of Four book were largely thinking about user interface environments, graphical user interface environments, where commands are largely used to run various kinds of actions when a user clicks a button or touches a screen or uses some other type of modality to interact with the, the user interface. So in that case, the commands were really sort of self-contained objects that were used to encapsulate a request to a service as an object, like open this file or delete this file or something like that. As people got more experience applying patterns to other contexts, like distributed systems, for example, or concurrent systems, it became clear that that original context was too narrow. And so from there grew the command processor pattern. And the command processor pattern is more about taking commands and passing them over to some kind of command processor where they're executed typically in a different thread or a different process. You'd be pretty darn hard pressed to extract that particular use case out of the original Gang of Four pattern for command. The Gang of the POSA 1 pattern of command processor did a nice job, but it also was deficient in certain ways. And so as people got more experience, they took shots at trying to write this stuff down. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is kind of an amalgamation of a number of different perspectives on command. And I think it turns out that the one that we're talking about here is very nicely related to what we see in Android, especially the intense, uh, the intense service framework. First, let's talk a little bit about the context, though, in which this appears. So we are going to want to be able to process some long-running action, where long-running in this context means something that would take potentially too long and would end up blocking the UI thread, such that you would get an ANR call. So if we're going to download some kind of image from some place, from a, from a server somewhere, that might take a while, depending on how big the image is, depending on how heavily loaded the, the device is, depending on, the, depending on how heavily loaded the network or the server, the server cloud, the storage, you know, whatever it is, depending on the load, it might take a while to download. So as a result, if we're not careful, we could end up blocking in that download call. The problem, as you all know, is if you do blocking calls from the main thread of control, the UI thread, that's going to run the risk of triggering the application not responding dialog. So something will go wrong. It'll say, this is not working. Do you want to shut it down? And so on. So that would be problematic. We don't want that to happen. Take a look here at this website for more information about the, the perils of ANRs and when they occur and what to do about them. So the solution here, which we've already talked about, but we're now we're going to start talking about it more from a pattern-oriented perspective, is to implement some kind of command processor in order to encapsulate a download request as an object that you can pass from an activity that you don't want to block to a service where that thing can run in some kind of background thread and run at its leisure. 
So this particular set of steps, this process might work as follows. You'd go ahead and implement a download service that would inherit from intent service. And you would have the ac activity then creating an intent. And into that intent, it would make the target of the, in the intent be the download service, its class file. You could add in stuff like the URI that you wanted and the callback messenger, if that's how you want to communicate back, or the pending intent, or the broadcast receiver, you know, however you want to get the information back. You could stick those things as extras into the particular intent. Then you go ahead and call start service with the intent. A lot of that stuff bundled in there. It's, it's target, it's extras, and so on. That will cause the Android Activity Manager service that we've talked about recently to go ahead and spawn off the, the service, to start the service, the download service, if it's not already running. <clears throat> Since that thing is implemented as an intent service, that will go ahead and start a thread in the background using the, the service um, the handler model we've looked at before. And then, of course, under the hood, that'll end up calling the on handle intent method, which will download the image in a separate thread. By the way, we had an interesting discussion on the mailing list about uh, the thread pool executor, which is part of your current assignment. And, and what might be the benefit of using that. So if you think about intent service, the intent service only lets there be one thread at a time, the, the background thread, that's being used to download the image. And that works for the very simple use case we just described here. You have one activity talking to one service, which is downloading one file. What might be the motivation for wanting to use some kind of thread pool executor instead? Anyone except Sean? <laughs> You have a list view filled with images, so we want to get them as fast as your CPU. Great. So, so one example would be that you've actually passed over a, a, a batch worth of things to download. And rather than doing them sequentially in that one thread, you want to go ahead and maximize the potential concurrency or parallelism in the system. Uh, modern Android devices often have quad-core processors, so why not take advantage of all that processing power to go ahead and do things in parallel? Uh, that would be one example. Another example might be a situation where you're trying to write some kind of download service, and you're going to have multiple things connecting to it, some of which might be triggered from background tasks, some of which might be triggered by user interface interactions, some of which might be triggered by the list view thing that Christoph just talked about. So in any case, you have the potential for multiple things to happen. So that would provide a good example of why you would want to have multiple threads running in a, in a service, be it in a separate process or in the same process as the original client. OK, you can take a look here, of course, for more information on intent service. We'll look at intent service in more detail later. So it turns out that this particular way of arranging things is, as often is the case, not just a random set of classes thrown together just for the fun of it. But this is actually an implementation of a pattern. And the pattern is the command processor pattern as described in those resources, POSA 1, that paper I showed you, the Gang of Four book. And the intent of this pattern, and I'm using this is the, from the paper I pointed you to, is to package a piece of application functionality as well as its parameterization as an object, the ability to take the functionality and, and objectify it, if you will, or encapsulate it, and make it usable in another context. The word context here is meant to be used loosely. It doesn't mean an Android context, such as in a later point in time, you might put it in the queue and run it later, or you might use it for example, to run in a different thread or a different process. So you want to be able to defer what you want to have done from when it gets done and how it's going to be done. So those things become different orthogonal dimensions, largely orthogonal dimensions in the design space. <clears throat> so here's a picture of the pattern from the POSA 4 book, which is a distillation of various things. We'll talk a bit more about the structure in a second. And there's a good link to go find out more about this particular pattern, the command revisited.pdf file. So when would, you go ahead, when would you want to apply this pattern? Well, there's a number of circumstances where it would become useful. One is a situation where you want to be able to decouple the decision of what code to execute from the decision of when this code should be run. So you might want to be able to specify what to run, and then be able to queue it, and then execute it later in some other context. You also might want to be able to do things in such a way where you can change the implementation of your service without breaking the client code that relies on it. You don't want to have to go and change the interface, for example, and recompile the client. 
you want to be able to pass some kind of more loosely coupled, loosely bound, message-like abstraction that's a bit more pliable, a bit more flexible, a bit more adaptable to the particular needs of your environment. So you don't tightly couple things. The key thing here is tight coupling. You want to avoid that. Another reason, which not, is not commonly used uh, for our use case, but is commonly used for user interface things like editors and um, document processors, as well as transaction-oriented systems, is the ability to undo or redo various commands. So if you are a Microsoft Word user and you're typing along and you make a mistake, then you can go ahead and undo what you just did, and it'll reverse what you just did. And then if you realize, oh, I really wanted to do that after all, you can then go ahead and redo it. So undo and redo work at the level of commands. You can go even further with this with various kinds of transactional capabilities, things like the ability to roll back a set of changes to a database in some way. And those are all examples of how you might use commands as things that you can execute to accomplish something, as well as unexecute to undo it if for some reason you discover that the results were not to your liking. Some systems like GNU Emacs gives you arbitrary levels of undo and redo. You can have those things go back to the beginning of your editing session, which could have been days before. It gets a little crazy after a while, mind you, but it's possible to do. Other environments give you very little undo. For example, in PowerPoint, I think you could typically undo up to your last save, for example. So you can't do arbitrary levels of undo. Other systems I've worked on in the past, like FrameMaker way back in the day, you could only undo the last thing that you did. So people are obviously trying to figure out a trade-off between devoting large amounts of memory to do something versus giving you lots of flexibility to undo and redo things at your convenience. Here's a picture that illustrates the structure and participants in this pattern. Again, keep in mind, this is the, the revisited ver command revisited version. This is not exactly what you'll see if you read the Gang of Four book or the Post of One book. But I think this is a good job. So you have something that you call a command, which has an an, a bunch of operations on it. And typically, there's some way of being able to execute the command. And then you often have a way of being able to customize or subclass or uh, somehow specialize the original command to make a concrete command. Now we'll see in Android that the commands we're going to be passing around in this particular environment are intents. And you typically don't inherit from an intent. Instead what you do is you take an intent and you add extras to it to add additional fields and information that will be used and stored along with the intent when you send it someplace. And we'll show some examples of this in just a second. You then have some kind of creator which is used to create these commands, as well as to pass them to something to do the work. In our particular context, the creator is going to be an activity of some kind, like a download activity. Then we have an executor or an executor, depends on whether you're a, someone who plays first person shooter games or whether you're someone who works as a bank accountant. And uh, so in this particular case, the executor is going to be the intent service. It's going to be the thing that actually executes the work associated with the command that it receives. And then there's an execution context, which could be a variety of different things. I've chosen to map that to the context that you get with Android. But there are other things you could map that to as well. OK, so that's the static view. So you get, from a structural perspective, you get the key participants who are involved and a brief description of what they do. Keep in mind, as is always the case with patterns, there are subtle variations quite possible. And they may not line up exactly what we're talking about here but it still may be the very same pattern. And that's perfectly OK. Let's now talk a little bit about the dynamics. That's how the structural participants interact with each other. So in this case, we have a creator, like an activity, that goes ahead and creates the intent and calls start service. Well, it creates the intent, puts a bunch of things into the intent, extras, data, and so on. And then it goes ahead and it calls start service. And that start service call causes the executor to wake up. And the exe executor then goes ahead and runs the on handle intent method. And the on handle intent method is what's going to be used to actually execute and process the intent that was sent over to the intent service as a command from the activity. So you can see how there's a pretty nice mapping kind of one to one on the various parts from the pattern description in the book into the parts that you find in Android. And as, as we've gone through this class, I've been amazed as I've looked more deeply into what Android's doing, the number of places in Android that map pretty much almost perfectly 
onto patterns that you commonly find in the Gang of Four book and the POSA books and other books as well. And that's, that's a good thing because it means that Android has high pattern density. It means the people who designed it either intentionally or accidentally, serendipitously, figured out how to tap into some really good time-honored ways of building these kinds of systems. It also means that once you understand these patterns, learning Android's a lot easier. And as you move to other environments that are not Android, but also implement those patterns, you'll be well disposed to be able to port your knowledge of design and architecture in much more interesting ways. By the way, it would be absolutely fascinating to take a look and see what architectural patterns went awry in the rollout of the Obamacare website. <laughs> I think that would be really fun. Somebody go in there and do some forensics and see what's lurking underneath the hood. <clears throat> I suspect you might find more anti-patterns than patterns, but you'd still learn a lot, a lot of stuff. Like um, regression, load testing is a good thing to do before you go live. That, that's, a, that's a pattern that they probably should have applied. I think the anti-pattern is uh, cross your fingers and hope for the best, right? That doesn't always work so well. <laughs> OK, so there's a lot of different consequences of using this particular pattern. Uh, some of the good things, the client is not blocked for a long duration of time. So if you take a look here, you can see here's just a little snippet of code we might have that's going to go ahead and start up an intent service, which is going to handle the request and then maybe reply via a messenger, who knows what. Um, and the way we do this, as you can see, is we, whoops, we create the intent. We say we want it to run with the download class. We set the data. We create a messenger. We stick that in as an extra. And then we call start service. And the call to start service does not block the client. It's not going to wait for that thing to start. It's just going to sort of fire it over there and uh, go on its merry way to be driven by further callbacks. Another thing you can do with this particular approach is you can allow different users to work with the service in different way via the commands that they pass. So here's an example, actually not too dissimilar from some of the stuff that you're doing for the latest programming assignment that's due tonight, where you might pass, you might have one implementation. Maybe you'd have an intense service. Maybe you'd have a, a regular service with the, the, arts, the on start command hook method. And you're going to get an intent. And that intent could contain extra information that could be used by the service implementation in order to figure out what concrete service request was actually being made by this particular intent command. So for example, if we get a messenger, that might say, aha, we're going to do a messenger download. If we don't get a messenger, then maybe we're going to do a broadcast download. We're going to download it and then broadcast, and so on and so forth. And the cool part about this, if you really think carefully about what this pattern is allowing you to do, it's giving you a common interface, namely start service, which always looks exactly the same. And you're using that common interface in order to be able to do a variety of things. And if you want to add more things to do, you don't actually have to change the start service interface. You just change the way in which you set up the intent command that will be passed to that start service interface. Any questions about that? So that's a good example of a pretty wide interface. You can pass a lot of different kinds of things through there because you're essentially passing a command object. And the command object can have extras that go with it to direct what the receiving service does when it actually gets the command. There are some downsides, of course. Uh, in the same way that it's nice that we can have a wide interface where we can pass all kinds of things through, it also means that you, as the implementer, the implementer of the service, have additional work to do in order to go about figuring out what it is you need to handle to write that service. In fact, if it's really open-ended, people can pass you intents that have extras that you don't understand. They could just throw various stuff in there, and either you ignore it because you didn't know to look for it, or if you get it, you're like, what's this thing? I don't know what to do with this. So that's one of the downsides of a very wide interface. Even though it doesn't require many changes to the interface when you enhance and extend the service capability, the services over time become difficult to understand because you don't really know what they do. Keep that thought in mind when we talk later about bound services, because bound services, as you see, are often, not always, but often used with more strongly typed interfaces, where you know ahead of time what you're passing. And the writer of the implementation knows precisely what it's getting. And so that allows you to be able to be a bit more strongly typed. Uh, and so we'll compare and contrast this later with, with the broker pattern. 
The other thing that you don't really get with command is you don't get two-way operations without some additional work. So for our particular case, and in fact you guys are seeing this in the current programming assignment, in our particular case, where you do need to get the result back, you have to do something else. You have to create a messenger and you know, send, or send back the reply to the messenger. You have to create a broadcast receiver and then broadcast back to that thing. You have to create a pending intent and get that back, etc. There's lots of different ways to do this, but you, the application developer, are responsible for putting out these protocols. It doesn't come pre-baked into the communication abstraction. And think about that too, because when we talk about bound services and the Android interface definition language, you'll see how those services give you additional capability uh, and additional ways to do this that requires less work at face value. There's some subtleties we'll talk about when we get to it, but at one level, two-way communication becomes somewhat easier. So what are some of the known uses? Well, the intent service, of course, is a great example of the known use. There's also other things you get in Android that behave much like this. So the runnable interface that you get is kind of a command. You can kind of make a runnable and you can pass that thing through uh, that to be processed in another thread of control by the, the message loop that's the looper that's in that thread of control that's associated with the handle that you talk to. Many user interface toolkits provide some support for, for commands in various ways. Uh, interpreters for command line uh, programs often do this. The GNU Emacs we talked about before uses commands and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty common pattern used in a lot of different places. So to wrap up, the command processor pattern gives us a nice way to be able to communicate information between a sender and a receiver and to do it in a way that makes it easy to accomplish asynchrony. And of course, that's because you aren't blocking waiting for the response to come back. And you can have things be concurrent. They can be networked and so on. Obviously, in Android, you get kind of concurrency that goes between threads or between threads in different processes. Android doesn't out of the box give you the command pattern implementation for network communication that goes to a server. You'd have to use some other means like the Apache libraries or something like that in order to be able to do that kind of communication.